The title of my presentation is uh, Preventing Type 2 Diabetes with Mediterranean Diet. Here you can see the, my potential conflicts of interest. The, my institution has received research funding from the International Nut and Diet Treat Foundation, that, who is supporting this program, and I am a non-paid member of the scientific committee of this International Nut and Diet Treat Foundation. Here you can see uh, other disclosures. And uh, I will talk especially about the PREDIMED trial. And the PREDIMED sponsors had no role in the design and the conduct of the study. So uh, um, also uh, has no role in the management, in the analysis, in the interpretation of the data, the review and the approval of all of the manuscripts that are in the presentation. As you know, uh, diabetes is a big public uh, health problem. Uh, more than 370 million of people in the world have diabetes. And it is expected that in 2030, uh, this will, ex will increase to more than 500 people, 500 million of people. The prevalence of type 2 diabetes is increasing in parallel to, to obesity. Type 2 diabetes is a potential risk factor for cardiovascular disease, but also by, by, for um, blindness, uh, renal failure, and lower limb amputation, decreasing the, the quality of life of people affected, and is responsible of 5% of total mortality. And in the next 10 years, it is expected uh, that mortality will increase by 50%. As you know, several risk factors have been identified, uh, risk factors for diabetes, for example, uh, low physical activity, smoking, overweight or obesity, the unhealthy diet or alcohol. And uh, I would like to talk today about the diet. diet. Uh, here in this slide, you can see a, a summary of meta-analysis of pros prospective cohort studies on food and beverage intake in relation to type 2 diabetes. And as you can see here in this um, uh, study that has been published by, by the group of Professor Frank Hugh from Harvard, uh, processed red meat and processed red meat, uh, white rice or sugar sweetened beverage are directly related to the risk of diabetes. Or for example, uh, green vegetables or uh, daily products, whole, whole grains, uh, alcohol moderation and or coffee or tea have been inversely related to the risk of type 2 diabetes. Here you can see the same, but in this case uh, we are talking about nutrient intake and glycemic variables uh, and type 2 diabetes. And as you can see, M iron, uh, glyce the glycemic index and the glycemic load of the diet, trans fatty acids have directly related to the risk of diabetes incidence. And, for example, uh, man the magnesium content of the diet, the cereal fiber or vitamin D are inversely related to this uh, disease. Uh, the mechanisms are unclear, but uh, probably uh, these uh, nutrients or this uh, uh, food can uh, modulate uh, insulin resistance and secretion by different mechanisms. So oxidation processes, modulating inflammation or endothelial function, and probably by this mechanism we can explain uh, several uh, this uh, this modulation of the risk of uh, this uh, of, of the diabetes. Uh, in relation to dietary patterns, it has been observed in several studies that uh, high uh, glycemic index diets and uh, the Western dietary pattern increase the risk of diabetes, whereas a low glycemic index diet, a DASH diet, or a prudent diet has inversely related to the risk of diabetes. And I will talk now about the, 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 the Mediterranean diet. As you know, the Mediterranean diet is a diet that is rich in olive oil that is used as a main culinary fat, abundant vegetable products, whole cereals, fresh vegetables and fruits, legumes, tree nuts, aromatic herbs, and spices for cooking, 
frequent intake of fish and salt fish, and a moderate consumption of wine, especially with meals, and a low intake of meat and animal products, uh, processed products, milk and milk products, and simple sugars. Uh, there, uh, we have uh, several uh, prospective, prospective studies analyzing this association between Mediterranean diet adherence and uh, incidence of diabetes. Uh, here you can see some of these trials. For example, the GC prevention study, the SUN study conducted on university graduates, the EPIC Interact study, the EPIC Greek cohort study, or the health professional for, for follow-up study. In all of these studies, it has been observed an inverse association between the adherence to the Mediterranean diet and the risk of uh, type 2 diabetes. In this uh, in this uh, protection is about between 12 and 83 percent in, the, uh, in uh, those uh, individuals closely adhering to, to the Mediterranean diet compared to those reporting the lowest adherence. And also we have two studies analyzing the, the association in relation to uh, uh, gestational diabetes and also it has been observed a protection of this condition of uh, the Mediterranean diet. Also, we have some evidence uh, from clinical trials uh, supporting that weight loss induced by a healthy diet and exercise promotion reduces the, the, uh, the risk of diabetes. Uh, here you can summarize some of these studies. For example, the Malmo study, the Duckwing study in China, the diabetes uh, prevention study in Finland, the, the, the DPP in USA, United States, or the, the IDPP, etc. In all of these studies, it, it has been compared the effect of a caloric restricted diet with physical activity promotion to a control diet. And as you can see here, the relative risk of diabetes incidence uh, is reduced uh, when uh, uh, people is, uh, uh, adhere to this uh, uh, healthy diet or to this uh, promotion on, 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 on exercise. And this protection is uh, between 28 and uh, 67, as you can see in this slide. However, in all of these studies, it's very difficult to, to, to delimitate what is more important, diet, exercise, the weight loss achieved during the study. So no study was conducted in the past to delimitate if a healthy diet per se without body weight loss nor physical activity promotion have preventive effects on new onset diabetes in individuals at high cardiovascular risk. And it's for this that we have uh, analyzed this uh, uh, hypothesis uh, in the context of the PREDIMET study. As you know, the PREDIMET study is um, a multicenter clinical trial co conducted by several groups in Spain, aiming to assess the beneficial effects of the Mediterranean diet on cardiovascular uh, disease in, in the primary prevention uh, context. Uh, all of the individuals randomized to this trial are all free of cardiovascular disease at baseline. And they have between 25 and 80 years and had a high cardiovascular uh, risk because they uh, have a type 2 diabetes at baseline or three or more cardiovascular risk factors, smoking, hypertension, high LDL cholesterol, low HDL cholesterol, overweight or obesity, or family history of cardiovascular disease. And these uh, individuals have been randomized to three intervention groups, two Mediterranean diet groups, uh, enriched with virgin olive oil or tree nuts, a mixture of walnuts, almonds, and hazelnuts, and we compared this effect on, of, uh, of a low fat diet, a control diet, uh, as the American Heart Association has been recommended during the last years, so without oils, without uh, vegetable fat, and without animal sources of fat. Uh, this study has been conducted in the context of uh, primary care centers of different uh, groups uh, from Spain. The trial started in, in October 2003 and terminated uh, in, in prematurely in July 2011 with a mean follow-up follow -up of uh, approximately five years. And as you can see here, the population, uh, a mean age of approximately 67 years uh, old, 50% uh, were women, 50% had diabetes at baseline, 
82% had uh, hypertension, and more than 90% had overweight or obesity. The primary endpoint of the PREDIMED trial comprised either cardiovascular death, myocardial infarction, or a stroke. But also we have ascertained several other secondary endpoints, for example, total mortality, myocardial infarction, heart failure, major types of different cancers, uh, dementia, but also diabetes. And uh, also we have ascertained intermediate outcomes, for example, uh, what happened with blood pressure, uh, lipid profile, several markers of inflammation, and fasting blood glucose and insulin resistance. The main focus of the uh, intervention in the PREDIMED trial is to introduce uh, changes in the overall food pattern more than to change the nutrient content of the diet or the energy content of the diet. And in both Mediterranean diet groups, we advise to consume to the participants uh, total fat ad libitum, uh, olive oil as a main culinary fat, abundant vegetable products, cereals, fresh, fresh vegetables and fruits, legumes, tree nuts, ar aromatic herbs and species, frequent intake of fish and shellfish, moderate consumption of wine, and a low intake of meat and milk products and uh, processed food and simple sugars. And in the control diet, we, we advise to the participants to follow a low-fat diet uh, 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 in order to reduce every type of fat of animal origin and vegetable origin. And the dietitians did not recommend that during the trial any energy restriction or changes in physical activity. So the, uh, what we observed in the predimetal is especially <laughs> secondary to the changes in this uh, dietary uh, food pattern. So we recommend a diet that is rich in tocopherols, in polyphenols, in flavonoids, in other phytosterols, etc. Uh, we have um, uh, analyzed, uh, we have measured the adherence to the Mediterranean diet uh, throughout a uh, 40 point score in order to measure the adherence to this Mediterranean diet with uh, 40 points. And this uh, uh, tool has been used in order, in order to increase the adherence to the, to the participants to the Mediterranean diet in order to scale in the score of this uh, 40 point. And this was one of the main important tools that we have used during the, the trial. Uh, the PREDIMED dietitians are directly the responsible of the dietary intervention with uh, uh, several strategies for behavioral changes, so quarterly individual contests during the trial, group sessions every three months. Uh, we give uh, several uh, important information, self-monitoring tools, individual goal settings using the, this 40-point questionnaire, and we give uh, for them in one group one liter per week of virgin olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, uh, uh, and uh, in the other group, 30 grams of this mixture of nuts. At, uh, in the pilot study, at three, uh, three months uh, uh, after starting the, the trial, we have uh, demonstrated beneficial effects on, uh, on insulin resistance measured by the HOMA method, as you can see here. In both Mediterranean, we have observed a decrease in both Mediterranean diet groups in comparison to the low fat uh, group. And also we have demonstrated beneficial effects on several markers of inflammation, for example, the CRP protein or the IL-6, uh, interleukin-6, or several markers of endothelial factors, etc. And in case of uh, our group in Reus, we have randomized 870 people. And uh, every year, uh, at baseline, uh, every year we have conducted to all the participants a glucose tolerance test in order to ascertain uh, diabetes incidence. And here you can see the result that we have published some, some years ago, in 2011, in diabetes care. As you can see here, uh, we have observed a higher number of uh, diabetic uh, incident patients in the control group in comparison to both Mediterranean diet groups. Here you can see the cumulative incidence. And here you can see the cumulative incidence of both Mediterranean diet groups compared to the control group. We have demonstrated a 52% reduction in the incidence of new cases of diabetes in both Mediterranean diet groups in compar compared to the control group, to the group that we advise to a low-fat diet. Uh, what is important is that we don't have observed differences in changes in body weight between the three groups. So 
that this uh, probably could be a, a reflect of these changes that we have conducted in the overall food pattern. We have also recently analyzed, in two, we have published this in, in analysis of internal medicine in two, 2014. Uh, and as you can see here, we have analyzed in all the core the incidence of diabetes, and also we have observed a higher number of individuals with incident diabetes in the control group, and we have demonstrated in all the, in the overall trial a 18% reduction in the risk of new cases of uh, diabetes in, in case of those supplemented with nuts, and 30% of new cases of diabetes, of the incidence of diabetes in those uh, 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 supplemented with virgin olive oil. And also we have demonstrated that those individuals adhering more to the Mediterranean diet had more benefits in terms of prevention of diabetes, as you can see in this slide. Now uh, we are analyzing, uh, here uh, is a working report, it's not too pleased, uh, these results. We are analyzing the complications of um, the diabetes, the microvascular complications, especially the retinopathy here and uh, nephropathy, and we have observed also a beneficial effect on the incidence of new cases of retinopathy in case of both Mediterranean diet groups, as you can see here, but uh, uh, no effects on diabetic nephropathy uh, during the trial. So, in conclusion, uh, in relation to the diabetes prevention and non-energy restricted Mediterranean diets enriched with extra virgin olive oil that is rich in uh, monounsaturated fatty acids, but also several other uh, anti-inflammatory, antioxidant molecules, uh, or three nuts that are rich in monounsaturated fatty acids or polyunsaturated fatty acids in case of walnuts, and also uh, rich in several bioactive, bioactive molecules uh, of these seed products can be useful for reducing, uh, decreasing insulin resistance, preventing metabolic syndrome and diabetes. I, uh, we have published the results of metabolic syndromes uh, this year and reducing the risk of retinopathy. And also we have demonstrated other beneficial effects published in New England Journal of Medicine, a 30% reduction of the incidence of cardiovascular disease during the trial. Um, so at the end, uh, a Mediterranean diet is a compendium of several food, several different food that by different mechanisms probably we can explain this reduction in the incidence of uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. Uh, here you can see the my unit uh, and also the PREDIMED principal investigators uh, the, that uh, give me the possibility today to present you this result. Thank you very much. I will talk about another dietary pattern, the Nordic dietary pattern, which we have much less data than, for instance, the Mediterranean diet. So, so this is more a, a future, also future field of research. To start with, uh, regarding the program, the sponsors of this uh, program for this uh, conference, I have no uh, conflicts of interest or, or received any support of any of those uh, partners. And uh, regarding commercial interest, I uh, have overall little conflicts of interest. I received some, some honoraria from, from uh, Dairy Council UK. <laughs> So to start with, then, uh, overall, what is a healthy Nordic diet? Sorry, I think I... <coughs> wrong button. Yeah. So that was the first. <coughs> this is my outline of the talk. And, and um, just to define what a healthy Nordic diet is, 
and uh, I will mainly talk about uh, pre-diabetic stage, the influence of, of a healthy Nordic diet on metabolic syndrome and pre-diabetes, basically because there are no studies on, in patients with diabetes. And I will focus this talk on, on presenting data from that's for the slide. Presenting data from uh, intervention trials mainly. Can you see this one? Yeah. So overall, Nordic diet or ND as I abbreviated it, um, is a traditional uh, local foods, traditional Nordic foods consu consumed in this uh, Nordic region. Northern Europe, and overall it's high in fruits, vegetable, high fiber legumes, and mainly low fat dairy, dairy products, fatty fish, and also uh, whole grain fibrous cereals such as ray, barley, and oats. So not so much wheat, and, uh, but also some almonds and hazelnuts. To start with, it, as I said, it was, there are no studies on diabetes prevention testing this, di this diet, but since the Finnish diabetes prevention study that was conducted in Finland, and in it's, it's the diets provided are not that far from the, the diets that, that I will show here. It's, it's uh, basically Nordic foods that were used, and it's uh, accordance with the dietary recommendations, the Nordic dietary uh, recommendations. So why eat Nordic food? So well, one it has been argued that that if you're eating f foods you are familiar with in that region, that might be easier to adhere to, to foods that you are familiar with and grow, grown up with, uh, uh, as compared to to eating foods that are more exotic or coming from other cultures. Uh, and um, there might be specific health, health effects of certain foods uh, in the Nordic, Nordic foods. For instance, rye, rapeseed oil, salmon, cabbage, barley, that, that we could um, have benefit from in, in a healthy diet. So there are a few trials, and, and the, 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 the trials that have been conducted have been quite similar. They have using similar types of foods and a similar dietary compositions, all uh, prudent diets uh, in line with the international and Nordic recommendations. A Nord diet study, I will talk, mention cis diet study and Chopu study. Uh, and and um, these diets are also inspired by the Mediterranean diets and also the DASH diets and portfolio diets, especially the Swedish study we did, we, we were inspired by the portfolio diet with the idea to having a lot of different uh, potentially beneficial components, food components that have, could, could improve cardiometabolic uh, <laughs> risk. So the Nordic study was a Swedish study that was the first uh, study where, where we tried to look at the whole diet as such, a whole Nordic diet, a healthy Nordic diet, diet as we de define it here. Uh, um, and it was a six-week study, so it's a short-term study, but all the foods were provided to the subjects. So it's a very highly controlled study, very uh, ambitious study in that sense. And, and we want to see what happens if you actually eat this food rather than just giving the advice. And we want to study uh, the effects on, on cardiometabolic risk factors uh, as compared to, to a diet, habitual diet, uh, Nordic diet, habitual control diet uh, in overweight subjects with elevated blood lipids. And the food uh, in this diet, <clears throat> and also in the, in the other trials mainly, were this was rather plant-based diet, high, high in fibers from vegetables, and the typical Nordic uh, vegetables and fruits, apples, pear, for instance. Uh, blueberry, lingonberries are also quite typically uh, used in Sweden and grown in, 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 in not only in Sweden, the whole Nordic, uh, Finland, Norway. 
Denmark, Iceland, uh, and uh, also root vegetables, potatoes, spinach, <laughs> and also beans and green peas are, are, are good sources of protein. And cereals, as I mentioned, um, more towards uh, rye, uh, barley, and oats rather than wheat. And rapeseed oil was the main uh, fat source, which was high in sat unsaturated fat, as both uh, N6 and N3 PUFAs, and also monounsaturated fatty acids, and also some nuts. And the fatty fish, typically uh, found in, in, in Nordic uh, seas. And, uh, uh, and, but also the diets were lower in red meats, uh, mainly contained in white meats, some, some moderate amounts of white meats. And uh, in this study was quite uh, low or moderate in, in dairy products and mainly included low-fat milk and low-fat cheese. So this was a parallel study with 88 subjects randomized for six weeks. And all, as I said, all uh, foods were provided. Uh, and this was an ad libitum diet where you were uh, you could eat as much as you wanted. So it was not the energy restriction or another uh, calorie uh, restriction. And uh, th this shows the diet before and after six weeks. And I just want to show here briefly that you have, in the control group, you see very little significant changes at all, very little change. And that was, of course, the, the point with uh, having a control group that it does not change. However, in, in, the, in the Nordic diet group, you can see a slight increase in protein, uh, carbohydrates, slight increase, mainly fiber-rich carbohydrates. As we can see, a quite large increase in dietary fibers. Improved fat quality, reduced saturated fat, some increase in PUFAs from fish, for instance. And also quite a large reduction in, in salt, because this was a diet to accord with the dietary uh, Nordic nutrition recommendations. And if you look at the overall effects on the metabolic risk factors, there was quite pronounced effect, especially on the blood lipids, which were the uh, primary outcomes. Um, as you can see, about 20% reduction in LDL cholesterol, but also uh, blood pressure was quite markedly reduced fasting insulin reduced, and also body weight reduced, uh, despite this was not a, a weight loss trial. And that was probably due to the high amount of fiber and, and uh, low energy dense uh, foods they were receiving. We also had, a, there was also a subgroup com uh, continue for, for additional t uh, four weeks. So the first uh, 11 subjects continued and in that group, we saw, if anything, more uh, further risk re reduction in the risk factors. So we did not see, uh, we did not um, suggest any any plateau plateauing of the effects of the six weeks. And uh, this is, if you compare the, the Nordic diet healthy Nordic diet compared to the, this case of Swedish reference populations, we can see it's, it's much higher in, in the fruits and berries, legumes. Um, also in, in this study uh, here, it was not significantly increased in cereals, but that was partly due to that the, there was very high intake overall in this population. But an increase in, in fats and oils and fish, for instance, but also lowering of, of of um, sweets and desserts and, and uh, added sugars. And all the details we have described uh, also in, in this paper, if you want to see more uh, how the diet and foods were composed in the Nordic diet. And we also asked if this, we saw this rather pronounced effects on risk factors, if it would be enough to, to just advise um, or intervene with a healthy Nordic breakfast. And that had not been done. So we wanted to s compare uh, healthy breakfast as the only intervention 
compared with a, a controlled breakfast, only in a breakfast eaters. There have been studies looking at breakfast eaters compared to non-breakfast eaters, but this is a healthy Nordic uh, diet. So we used the, 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 basically the, the breakfast that we given in this Nord diet trial I just show you, and compared it uh, for, for in a parallel randomized control study for, for um, uh, 12 weeks was the intervention. So 79 uh, subjects were randomized and very little dropout during these three months. Only one subject was lost to follow up. <coughs> and uh, what we saw, there was little change because we also measured glucose tolerance. We want to measure uh, glucose metabolism. There was no change in glucose tolerance in blood lipids or fasting glucose. And that was uh, a bit surprising, but still it, it's, it's, it's only um, changing or advising the breakfast. So that tells us that you need a much larger and more of a dietary pattern approach, a larger intervention to, to achieve these effects rather than only uh, altering the diet. However, we saw a reduction in abnormal fat content, a significant, and we also saw a lowering of CRP. And this is quite interesting because you have no weight change. This is also isocaloric status, no weight change or difference between the groups in, in weight change. And there uh, was quite a robust uh, reduction in, in the CRP levels after the uh, three months of the, on the Nordic breakfast. And uh, the, the other uh, study I would like to mention uh, uh, is the CIS diet consortium. CIS diet stands for uh, uh, system, uh, systemic um, systems biology in dietary intervention court studies. And that is, a, as you can see, a network with all the Nordic countries. <coughs> it was coordinated and, and uh, driven by, by the Finnish University of Eastern Finland. Matti Usetupa was the PI for this study, funded by Norforsk, the Nordic Minister of Health Council. Uh, and we wanted to do a more long term study. To, to look at the effects of a Nordic diet. And again, the, as in the previous trial, short-term trial, this was a similar um, intervention with increasing cereals, fibers, vegetable fruits, typical from uh, Nordic origin. Rapeseed oil is the basic fat, and, and lower, uh, uh, lower red meats, increased fish. As compared to a controlled diet, which in similar to the PREDIMED study, they received some products also in this control diet. So that was, should represent an average Nordic diet. Uh, so this was a more normal uh, diet, and this was supposed to be the more healthy Nordic diet. Subjects with a metabolic syndrome were included. And this was a study with parallel, uh, two parallel groups with up to 24, 18 or 24 months of follow-up. And a lot of measurements, including adipose tissue biopsies and glucose tolerance tests before and after intervention. In this study, there were some dropouts, especially in the, in the, in the control group due to unwillingness to follow the control diet. Uh, so, ending up with with uh, 96 in the health diet and uh, 73 subjects in the control diet after uh, 24 months. Oh, sorry, weeks. Um, the prime one of the primary outcome was blood lipids, and here there was significant reductions, especially in um, LDL cholesterol increase in HDL cholesterol, also APB redu was reduced in the, in the uh, end Nordic diet. There was, however, no um, improvement in the glucose tolerance or, or glucose metabolism, as we can measure, which was um, a negative finding. <clears throat> but this is uh, it's important to remember, this is an isocaloric study. No weight change occurred, no, no difference between the groups in weight. However, we also, in this study, study saw some, some improvements or reduction in, in pro-inflammatory marker. And this, this marker 
interleukin-1 receptor antagonist is quite interesting because it's increased several years before the onset of diabetes. Frank Hu and others have shown that, that this is elevated six, six years before you develop diabetes. So it's an interesting marker of, of developing type 2 diabetes. And this marker was reduced or, or prevented by the, by the Nordic diet. And in line with that, we also in the biopsies, we, we measured doing micro global transcriptomic uh, analysis, we, we measured pro inflammatory gene expression and saw that, that, that several genes, uh, inflammatory genes in adipose tissue, was, was down regulated after the um, Nordic diet uh, for, for three months, uh, th uh, six months as compared to the. To the control diet, the adipose tissue of the controlled subjects. And this again was independent of, of body weight changes. It's, it's well known that if you reduce body weight, you, you improve uh, systemic inflammation. I will be quick now. Um, this is a, also a, a subgroup analysis from, from this uh, SUS diet study where we used the biomarker approach, serum biomarkers, to capture uh, different aspects of the diet, whole grains, alkyl resorcinols, in plasma, fatty acids, and phospholipids, and beta-carotene, to capture those uh, subjects who were compliant compared to those non-compliant. And, <clears throat> and here we see that the, the most compliant and the more compliant subjects had a might, as expected in a way, but m much more clear reductions in blood lipids using this, uh, uh, defining them according to, to biomarker status. If they change in, in these biomarkers, that should change according to the dietary uh, intervention. And also blood pressure was almost twice as large reduction in the systolic um, blood pressure in the most compliant subjects after the, after the um, uh, Nordic diet compared per, per to the control diet. And finally, another study, latest study uh, conducted, is a Danish study, it's a large, also large project called the New Nordic Diets. It's also very, quite similar to the other um, uh, diets I showed you with high intake of vegetables, Nordic uh, based vegetables, root vegetables, and uh, <coughs> also high in fish, in, in the whole grains, and uh, lower in meat, um, and um, not so much change in their products. So, so again, a, a quite plant-based uh, diet. And, and this was also ad libitum diet, and, and there was pronounced effects on body weight reduction of the 26 weeks. So this was more, more than half year intervention as compared to the control. And uh, this was also accompanied by, by quite robust reduction in, in, the, in the blood pressure in line with the previous study. And this is uh, a study that was conducted, the uh, uh, investigation was on Astrup uh, and this, uh, there have been other uh, sub uh, papers of this studies, study also recently. They did a subgroup analysis on patients or subjects with prediabetes, and in those in the, that subgroup they saw uh, significant reductions in in, in the fast insulin markers of insulin sensitivity. However, as you can see. There's 14 subjects in the Nordic diet, and this is control, only five, so I think we need to be a bit careful uh, when we look at this data. But still, there was uh, indicating beneficial effects on, on insulin sensitivity. And finally, there have been a few large court studies where you use this Healthy Nordic Food Index, which is a scoring um, index where you, where you have a root vegetables, fish, whole grain rye, whole grain oats, apples and pears and cabbage as the, as the key uh, foods. So you, the higher you consume, the, the, the higher scoring. So there's no negative scoring as you have in some, some other uh, health indexes, for instance. Uh, so this is only 
these are the only foods based uh, included in the scoring. But in one Danish cohort and one Swedish cohort of, as you can see, quite large cohort, prospective cohort studies, high adherence to this uh, healthy Nordic food index uh, was inversely related to, to all cause mortality after uh, adjustment for, for several confounders. So to summarize, healthy Nordic diets are pl pl mainly plant-based diets, uh, high in local vegetable legumes, fruits, berries, but also uh, a lot of fatty fish and, and uh, some dairy foods. And these foods, that these diets that have been tested have mainly accorded with uh, nutrition guidelines. And the, the ad libitum trials show more pronounced effects, and partly because the weight loss probably mediated some of these reduction in risk factors. But not all the risk factors seem to be mediated by weight loss. And we still lack intervention studies of, no, of Nordic diet in, on diabetes prevention. And uh, that's, that could be a f uh, future topic, of course. So I thank you for this. I'd like to talk about vegetarian diets and diabetes. Um, first of all, um, you're looking at disclosures. Um, I have received no financial or uh, in-kind support for this presentation. Um, I do uh, declare one conflict of interest, which is that I write books and I sometimes get royalties from them um, and uh, have no uh, industry funding. And in order to mitigate any bias, I'm going to do my best to present <coughs> studies fairly and to make the references available for any studies that I cite. Um, I might mention one other source of bias, which is that I grew up in Fargo, North Dakota. I don't know how many of you have been there or seen the movie, um, but all of the dietary guidance that I'm going to provide this morning is in somewhat conflict with my own past. Um, I'd like to start out in Japan, uh, and the reason I want to talk about Japan is when we talk about diabetes, so many people will say, the problem in diabetes is sugar and anything that turns to sugar. So don't eat bread, and don't eat pasta, and don't eat beans, and don't eat potatoes, and don't eat rice. Well, if you look at Japan, what is the dietary staple of Japan? You eat huge amounts of rice, breakfast, lunch, dinner, rice, all the time. And if you look at diabetes prevalence in Japan in adults over the age of 40, before 1980, diabetes was quite rare, 1 to 5% of the population. Now, what happened in Japan right around 1980? Okay, yes. As uh, my friend Bill Costelli from the Framingham Heart Study always says, when you see the golden arches, you may be on the road to the pearly gates. Um, <laughs> it may, may be true. Uh, meat came in. This is not traditional Japanese food. And the fat content of the Japanese diet went uh, up quite dramatically. Not as bad as ours, but it went up. And carbohydrate went down. Less rice is being consumed. And if you look at overweight, you see uh, a difference by gender. For women, there wasn't a lot of change, really, for social reasons, cultural reasons. Women are, were not out of the home so much, but men were eating at fast food places and having business lunches, and men started gaining weight. So what happens if you have a population? eating more fat and gaining weight. What happens to diabetes? Well, by 1990, it was 11 to 12%. And this shows us two things. The first thing is that diabetes is not primarily a genetic condition. There are genes that are important, but environment looms large. Secondly, rice does not cause diabetes. Um, let's take a lesson from the United States. Uh, meat consumption has gone up dramatically, especially in the post-World War II period, uh, especially chicken. Americans eat more than a million chickens per hour. Imagining this to be health food. That's right. 
Yes, this will be on the test. Um, let me say a special word of condemnation for cheese. Back a century ago, cheese was a European thing. Americans couldn't get through four pounds of cheese in a year. But fast food chains and pizza restaurants have escorted cheese into our diets as never before. The problem with that is it's 70% fat, mostly saturated fat. It may smell like old socks, but people have gotten hooked on this very much. And it has escorted fat into our diets like never before. Uh, sugar, there are many different types of sugar, but the top line here, the red line, shows total sugars. It's not your imagination that's gone, gone up as well. So if you go back two decades, and you look at Fargo, where I grew up, or Montana, Minnesota, less than 4% of the population had diabetes. Louisiana and Mississippi in disgrace at 6%. But as meat went up and cheese went up and sugar went up, uh, as the years go by, here's 95 and 96 and 97 and 98. And diabetes doesn't wait. As the diet changes, the map changes very quickly. In 2006, I'm going to change the colors because we are zeroing in on counties. But we've seen the same progression of the disease. OK, uh, who does better? Uh, researchers have studied Seventh-day Adventists uh, because they lend themselves to study very well. As a population, generally speaking, they are asked to not smoke and to avoid alcohol and avoid caffeine and avoid meat. And almost all Adventists are very good at the first three of those. Um, so you have a, a health-conscious, non-smoking population. And in 2009, the American Diabetes Association published these data looking at body mass index in nearly 61,000 Adventists. And they split them into five groups depending on the diets that they followed. And the first uh, bar is what they called non-vegetarians, typical meat eaters. And their BMI was not below 25, where we'd like to see it, but it was 28.8. And the next group was semi-vegetarians, meaning people who ate meat but less than once a week, a little bit thinner. The third group was the folks who ate fish, but no other meats, and they were somewhat thinner. And then the ovo-lacto vegetarians, the green bar. And finally, vegans. And I have to remind my patients that a vegan is not a person from the planet Vegas, <laughs> uh, but simply a person who, who avoids all animal products. And they happen to be not only the slimmest group, but the only group whose mean BMI was right there in the healthy range where we'd like to see it. But this is not why the ADA published these data. They published it because of diabetes. And there you see this dramatic gradient that the more the animal products are gone, the lower the prevalence of diabetes. And, and whenever I present these data at scientific conferences, I can just hear the audience saying, wait a minute. Yeah, those vegans have only 2.9% diabetes, but they're probably better educated, more physically active, they're thinner, they are probably more wealthy, and so forth, maybe so. So let's adjust for BMI, age, sex, ethnicity, physical activity, and other factors. And you still see that there's something about the diet that has quite a powerful effect on diabetes risk. So my team in Washington, DC, decided to put this diet to the test for people who had never done anything like that before. We brought in a group of women all after the age of menopause, all moderately to severely overweight. And we asked them to follow two guidelines. The first was no animal products. And the second was to minimize added oils. And we did not ask them to limit calories or limit carbohydrates or limit portions. We asked them not to change their exercise pattern. So all they're doing is two things, no animal products, keeping oils low. And it was a 14-week trial. And the menu looks rather liberal when you present it to the patients. I can have blueberry pancakes, no pat of butter, but I can drown it in maple syrup if I want to. Uh, oatmeal with cinnamon and raisins. And if I have chili, it just has to be the vegetable chili. And if my linguine arrives, instead of the meat sauce or the Alfredo sauce, it'll be topped with artichoke hearts and seared oyster mushrooms and chunky tomatoes and that kind of thing. And at 14 weeks, the average person had lost 13 pounds. Uh, two inches off their waist, and their insulin sensitivity measured by glucose tolerance was significantly improved. And we tracked them for two additional years against a control group following the National Cholesterol Education Program diet, a chicken and fish diet. And we found that although the control group gained back their weight, the vegans uh, never did. And they were skinnier at two years than, than at baseline. Uh, we recently published a meta-analysis looking at every study we could find using plant-based diets for body weight. And if you're to the left of that, that zero line, that's the, the right-hand 
line there is the zero line. Every single study is to the left of that line. And what that means is that every study shows that when you put people on a plant-based diet, they lose weight. It's, it's predictable. Um, so then we did a follow-up study, and I want to tip my hat to David Jenkins, who helped us with uh, in the design of this study, where at this point we did a study in individuals with type 2 diabetes using an intervention that was vegan and low fat, but also low glycemic index in this case. Uh, we had a control group following what were the ADA guidelines at that time, reducing calories, keeping carbohydrate limited and relatively even from day to day. It was a 22-week trial and a one-year follow-up with 99 participants. And we had no dropouts at all in the first 22 weeks, which doesn't mean everyone followed the diet perfectly. It means I got a needle in everybody's arm uh, at 22 weeks. And at 74 weeks, we had 86% uh, compli or, uh, per continued participation in the vegan group and 90% in the ADA group. And the first thing to present is the A1C data which fell in both groups about 0.6 in the control group following the ADA guidelines and one full point in the vegans. And this is not a significant difference between the two, although both groups did well. There was no untreated control. Um, however, there's a huge problem with these data, as anybody who treats people with diabetes with intervention diets knows, which is that your phone rings about four days later with hypoglycemic patients. Um, they have been treated with insulin or sulfonylureas. You've now improved their diets, and they're, they're hypoglycemic, which forces you to reduce their medications, which introduces a humongous confounder. So now I would like to present the data on individuals who did not make any medication changes at all, either because they were treated with diet alone or metformin or something else that didn't cause hypoglycemia. And here you see something remarkable. The drop in the control group in A1C was 0 0.4, which is, a, which is a nice drop in A1C. But the average reduction in A1C in the people on the plant-based intervention was 1.2 absolute percentage points, which is impressive. Uh, when we tracked them after a year and a half, uh, the control group got back to baseline, and the plant-based group never did quite get there, although you do see some loss of their gains. Uh, when we look at body weight, both groups lost weight, and it's not a significant difference between the two. What is remarkable is that although the ADA group was asked to cut calories, the vegan group was not, and yet they lost more weight. Um, and, and by the way, the reasons for this is not rocket science. You're eating foods that are lower energy density because they have less fat in them and more fiber in them. So weight loss tends to occur without a person intending it. Uh, LDL drops as no big surprise. You're not eating cholesterol. You're not eating animal fat. Um, so we recently published a meta-analysis on every plant-based uh, intervention study we could find looking at its effect on A1C. And there's the zero line in the middle. And as you can see, every study uh, looks to improve uh, hemoglobin A1C. So the effects are quite um, striking. Um, how does this work? What, what I just said is that people were eating rice and beans and spaghetti and, and high carbohydrate foods with no caloric limit, yet they lose weight, their cholesterol goes down, and their diabetes gets better. And so I'm asked this quite frequently, and I find myself drawing on the back of a napkin at the airport for the person who's asked me this question, uh, what's going on in the body as best I understand it? Uh, let me share this with you, because I also share this with patients. This is a muscle cell, which is the site of insulin resistance, of course, also in the liver. And the glucose is trying to get into the cell with the assistance of insulin. And so the insulin key will attach to that receptor and signal these receptor, uh, the cell to open up to receive glucose. That's what's supposed to happen. And a person with type 2 diabetes has insulin, and they've got receptors, and the binding is fine. There's no problem there. The problem is inside the cell. And when I was a child, there was a favorite trick that some of the neighbor kids played, which was to put chewing gum in the locks of other people's houses when they weren't home. And you would arrive home, and your key would no longer open your door. Well, you don't have chewing gum in your cells, but what you do have is fat that is accumulating inside the cell and stopping that insulin key from being able to function. And you can think of this as accumulated beef fat and chicken fat and fryer grease getting in the cell. Uh, now, it's the, the situation is somewhat more complex than that, but not a lot. 
And as that fat accumulates, insulin resistance worsens. So how much animal fat is in a vegan diet? Well, there isn't any. And if I keep vegetable oils low, that fat very likely starts to dissipate. And even though I'm not counting calories and carb grams, the fundamental issue in type 2 diabetes is being addressed by the diet, which is this accumulation of fat. Now, doctors hate words like fat because it has one syllable, so we'll call it intramyocellular lipid, but that's what we're addressing here. All right, this is Vance. Vance was uh, a policeman in Washington, D.C. His father was dead by age 30. Uh, Vance was 31 when he was diagnosed with diabetes, late 30s, uh, began the vegan diet, lost 60 pounds, stopped his diabetes medications, his A1C dropped from 9.5 to 5.3, um, which is a good A1C to have. Um, and when I asked his permission to share his findings with you, he said, make sure you tell everyone that my erectile dysfunction went away as well. Um, <laughs> that's, he's smiling, I see. Um, this is Nancy, similar situation. She lost 40 pounds, stopped her diabetes medications. Her A1C dropped a lot, although she's still in the diabetic range. Uh, her arthritis improved, effectively went away. And if any of you are interested in why would a plant-based diet improve an inflammatory process like rheumatoid arthritis, um, I'd be glad to talk to you about that, uh, that later on. But in, my guess is it has to do with removing dairy protein. Um, so when we prescribe the diet, there are three steps that we use with people who have type 2 diabetes. It's vegan, it's low in fats and oils, and it's low glycemic index. And we give our individuals the power plate fruits, grains, vegetables, legumes. And we actually sent this to the US government in 2009, we, the Physicians Committee. Didn't hear back from them. Uh, so we filed a lawsuit in 2011 to compel response. And I don't know if you saw what the government came up with in 2011. This is called my plate. This is US government policy. I'm, I'm taking no credit for this, but it looks somewhat uh, similar to what we sent them a couple of years earlier. There is no meat group in US guidelines. There is a protein group, which could be meat, but it can be nuts, and it can be beans, and it can be tofu. Um, the dairy group includes soy milk as well as cow's milk. Um, the, the last thing that I would like to talk about today is how the heck do you prescribe this? Because many, many patients will say to me, I do that in a minute but my family's gonna divorce me, I'll have to live in the garage, I don't know how to make this work, da -da, I'll never get a lunch date again, and, and doctors are afraid to prescribe it. So we have developed a way that breaks us into two steps and I have never seen anyone unable to do it. And I'd like to describe, for any of you who are clinicians, how to work with patients on this, because it's very easy and it works better than, than other diets. The first is invite the patient to just check out the possibilities. For the first week, you do not ask the patient to make a change. They're just checking out the possibilities. You give them a piece of paper that says breakfast, lunch, dinner, snack, and ask them to try out different foods. So for breakfast, if they haven't had oatmeal since they were a kid, now is the time to cook it. And if they've never tried almond milk, let's see how that is. And then for lunch, I never had a pizza without cheese. Will that work? This week, we'll try it. Uh, try the veggie dogs. All they're doing is testing out the possibilities. And they go to an Italian restaurant and discover that they're happy to make them a full meal that's entirely without animal products. Same thing with Mexican cuisine. The bean burritos and the veggie fajitas are fine. Uh, Chinese, even easier. Um, they're a little bit wedded to their bottles of oil, but it's quite easy to do the vegan part and you can negotiate about fat content. Uh, extra points for Japanese because it's very often quite low in, in fat overall. Uh, when the person goes to the sandwich place or the, the taco place, this may not be the pinnacle of culinary art, but there are plenty of choices that the patient can try. So after a week, they come back in with their sheet all filled out and they said, I've got my breakfast and lunches and dinners. And at that point, you go on to step two, which is let's try a three week test drive. All vegan, all the time, three weeks. At the end, the patient will do it because it's only three weeks. At the end of that time, what they discover is number one, they're healthier. They're losing weight, their blood sugar is down, they're feeling better. Number two, their tastes have changed, which they were not expecting and you didn't tell them was gonna happen. But you remind them, do you remember when you switched to skim milk? At first it was kind of watery, but you sort of got used to it. And then if you ever tasted whole milk again, what was that like? Oh yeah, you're right, I don't like that anymore. It's too greasy. When you lighten the diet, the first week on a vegan diet, it does feel light. 
you're going to think, I've got to acquire a taste for folk music now. Uh, break out the tie-dye. OK, I'm vegan. Well, the second week, it starts to make sense. And you discover there are lots of websites and books and products all over the store that are kind of cool. And you discover there are many celebrities and former US presidents and their vice presidents doing exactly this diet. And it's, it's a lot easier than you thought. Um, and then we also never give a patient a diet and just send them home. We always schedule a weekly class. And I just want to show you quickly how we do it. Uh, it can be taught, taught by a dietitian, a nurse, a physician, a health coach. I like to have at least 10 patients because if it's fewer than that, they feel they're under the microscope a little bit, but not more than 20 because they get lost. And you can mix diagnoses, diabetes, dyslipidemias, weight issues, doesn't matter, it's all the same intervention. And uh, we have a curriculum that I will give you for free at pcrm.org. You can download it and, and, and please use it. Uh, the, the agenda starts with a weigh-in. The patients come in and they are weighed privately by a female staffer. And we, we always do that just because we've learned that a lot of women don't like having a man look over their shoulder at the number on the scale. Um, and then for the first half hour of the group, they go around the room and each one describes their successes and their challenges. I lost three pounds, but I got a wedding next week. And the other group members say, well, what can we do before we get there? And then the second half of the group, we do some kind of education, a video, a PowerPoint, or something like that. And again, we have a whole series that we'll give you for free. Um, we have additional materials, the nutrition guide for clinicians. We give to every second year medical student for free. Um, we have nutrition CME. Um, we have an online program called the Kickstart, in which every day you get an email for three weeks with menus and recipes and cooking videos and a free app. There's no commercial sponsorship for this and there's no charge. It's in English and Spanish and Mandarin and we have one for people from the Indian subcontinent and also have recently started a Japanese program for this. We have had 430,000 people go through these various programs. Um, and lastly, I would invite you to come to Washington July 31st when we are at our most sweltering. We would love to have you come to our International Conference on Nutrition and Cardiovascular Disease where we'll talk about the origins of heart disease in childhood, perhaps in utero. Um, and maybe just w one quick word. Um, I, it's very important for us to be specific. When we talk about diabetes, it's not about eating right and exercising and avoiding sugar. It's going to a plant-based healthy diet. Exercise is good, but that alone is not going to eliminate the diabetes uh, thing. Avoiding sugar is a smart idea, but that alone is not it. That's like saying lung cancer is all due to radon. Some of it is, but there's a lot bigger issues that we've got to deal with. Finally, it's really important that we make noise. A generation ago, we dealt with tobacco. And the tobacco industry was big. And we were afraid of it. But my hospital finally made the decision that we were going to ban smoking in the hospital, which we did, biting our lip. And within two weeks, we knew we'd done the right thing. And every hospital, and every restaurant, and every business, and every government building has done exactly the same thing. Today, that's where we are with food. We're fooling around with it, knowing we've got to do something. But if we take action, we can win there, too. It means being specific, giving the, our government ministers the, the cover that they need. They need to say, doctors want this. That's the reason we're doing it. If we do that, I'm convinced that we can win. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Bear Sinnott. I'm the president of Old Ways, and we're in Boston. Thrilled to be here, and I uh, want to thank the organizers as well, Cyril and John, and then also Sonia and Doreen for getting us all here. Um, I'm also honored to be a part of this panel, and um, to be after Neil Barnard, uh, you're a hard act to follow. It's a great presentation. Uh, these are my disclosures. So the program that I'm talking about has been funded by the Walmart Foundation, and we also had a lot of um, in-kind in support from community organizations. 
Um, I work for Old Ways, and we have this grant, and, uh, but the Walmart, Walmart Foundation um, did not have any input into the creation of the pyramid or the curriculum that I'll be talking about. And if you don't know Old Ways, we're a nonprofit food and nutrition organization, and our mission is to improve public health through cultural models for healthy eating like the Mediterranean diet or the African heritage diet that I'll be talking about. We like to say, let the old ways be your guide to good health and well-being. And we're not scientists. We don't uh, do scientific research. We take work like the PrediMed or work that Dr. Barnard has been doing and put these into positive and practical programs. And this. Uh, quote from Michael Pollan in the New York Times really captures what old ways is all about. I have yet to hear of a traditional diet from any culture anywhere in the world that's not substantially healthier than the standard American or maybe Canadian diet. The more we honor cultural differences in eating, the healthier we will be, what Rick was talking about earlier this morning. And here are examples of uh, great traditional foods from around the world. Old Ways is best known for our cultural models for healthy eating, the traditional diet pyramids um, with the Mediterranean, Asian, Latin American, um, not here, but we do have a vegetarian and vegan pyramid, and most recently, an African heritage diet pyramid. And this is the reason why we're doing what we're talking about. Um, you've seen uh, these charts before increase in energy consumption with uh, rise in um, diabetes, obesity, um, with uh, meat consumption increasing as well. And then for the African heritage, for the African Americans, they have particular problems with diabetes, um, more likely to be diagnosed with diabetes. They have higher blood pressure, more end-stage renal disease. They're hospitalized for diabetes more often, and they die more often. This um, symbol, the Sankofa symbol, is really emblematic of old ways and why we're doing what we're doing with the African heritage. Um, this symbol is an African symbol, and what it, it's uh, taking the best of the, the past and bringing it forward. This bird is reaching back and bringing the egg forward um, to bring the best of the past forward. And the African Heritage Diet Pyramid is uh, based on the culinary traditions of the African diaspora, which, is, uh, which are Africa, the Caribbean, um, the American South, and parts of South America. There's a lot of evidence. Um, these are just two studies. We have quite a few um, on our website that show the change when people leave their traditional diets, when they leave their diets of Africa or the Caribbean and uh, adopt a more Western diet. There are a lot more chronic diseases that occur. To put the pyramid together, we put together a consensus committee um, made up of nutrition scientists, culinary historians, and public health officials. And this is the pyramid that we ended up with. And we look at these as inspirations for change, like uh, Dr. Barnard's um, plate, um, a tool that consumers and health professionals can use to incorporate um, these culinary traditions into dietary recommendations. And we're also talking about um, using heritage as a motivator. Uh, Old Way's tagline is health through heritage. And so that looking at heritage as a, a motivator, a reason to change behavior, a, a connection. And then looking at the pyramid, um, the base of the pyramid, um, like all of our pyramids, are physical activity, lifestyle attributes, cooking, gardening, um, moving, walking, playing soccer, and then also eating together. The bottom level of the pyramid um, are leafy greens, and the culinary historians told us that um, leafy greens were so much a part of these diets that they're really um, in a category by themselves. And then the next layer up are all the plant foods, um, tubers and mat tubers and uh, uh, vegetables, whole grains, rice, beans, and um, fruits. Um, follow. Uh, Rice and beans are, are very common dishes all over the African diaspora, and actually all over the world. It's part of culinary traditions. Um, nuts and seeds, there's seafood in uh, fishing communities, 
um, meat is uh, eaten smaller, and um, you'll also see uh, uh, herbs are uh, their own um, category because they give um, cultural identity to food, and, and they're very important to um, the culinary tradition. <coughs> but we had this pyramid. How do we put it into practice and, and make it a, uh, a new social norm? We have a number of uh, educational materials. I think you have all of these in your registration material. You've got African heritage, uh, vegetarian, vegan, and whole grains. But this um, African Heritage 101 explains the pyramid. And you can see on the front, it's about claiming your health by claiming your history. Diabetes is not part of your heritage, and neither is heart disease. You have the power to claim all of this by claiming history. We have a number of resources on our website, setting up a kitchen, um, a pantry, African Heritage grocery list, um, also um, recipes. This is a jollof rice, a West African dish. Health studies, a food glossary, and um, we have a quarterly newsletter. We also put together plates. We call these uh, 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 plates um, from the different regions of the diaspora. Um, we put together a soup, a rice and beans dish, and a protein dish for each of the four regions, Africa, South America, the Caribbean, and, and the American South. We have a, a continuing education program for dietitians um, to learn the science, but also to learn about the food and embrace the food traditions. Uh, we may have a, a new hot cuisine. You'll be seeing African heritage restaurants. And most importantly, we have a six-lesson nutrition and cooking program called A Taste of African Heritage. The six lessons, each one um, look at a different part of the pyramid, herbs and spices, fruits and vegetables, mashes, greens, and um, whole grains. We've also just uh, finished one for the Latin American diet. And um, these, uh, we've taught these, uh, we started out with a 15-site uh, pilot and followed it up in 2013 and 14 with 100 sites that did this class. And we measured, um, we took surveys before and after the class, uh, looking at lifestyle changes, behavioral changes, but we also measured weight, weight circumference, and blood pressure. And these are the results. Um, there were big changes in, um, in lifestyle, cooking more, eating more vegetables, more rice and beans. Um, eating vegetarian meals, exercising. And then also, um, there was a reduction in weight, uh, waist circumference, and blood pressure improved as well. And I had hoped to play a video here, just a few minutes of it, but I... Sonia, I, I don't see it here in, in the... Um, but on our website, which is oldwayspt.org, um, we do have this uh, wonderful video that shows um, the classes and the, how the participants embraced the food and the culture um, to make dietary changes. So thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here, and uh, thank you. Thank you, Sara. We move on with the second oral presentation, which will be given by... Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Hanna Kaleova. I work as a medical doctor and researcher at the Institute for Clinical and Experimental Medicine in Prague, Czech Republic. And first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'm happy to be here with you and to share some of the results from, from our study. We have a difficult topic and only 10 minutes to go, so I will do my best. So 
So first, uh, uh, this uh, work was supported by Ministry of Health uh, of, of Czech Republic. Uh, I have no uh, conflict of interest. Uh, what are the persistent organic uh, pesticides, uh, the organic uh, pollutants, uh, so-called POPs? They are man-made chemicals, uh, and they have been shown to increase the risk of cancer, but also metabolic disease, including uh, obesity and diabetes. Uh, although uh, their production has been worldwide limited, uh, they have been still accumulating um, in our environment due to, they, due, due to their uh, lipophilicity and also due to their resistance to degradation. <clears throat> you are probably aware of some of them like polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, or uh, organochlorine pesticides, OCPs. Um, from um, the human production through the uh, wastewater, uh, the, the plants are exposed, and uh, that's a reason that uh, why so many people say, well, you cannot encourage people to eat vegetables and fruits because they are contaminated. Uh, however, only a few people um, realize that due to the uh, lipophilicity, uh, they accumulate especially in animal products, in the fatty foods. Um, of course, these chemicals are in, in the environment, in low concentrations, they are also in the air and in water, uh, and uh, in low concentrations they are in plant foods, uh, but they accumulate throughout the food chain, and the highest concentrations uh, are on the top of the food chain. Uh, the richest sources of, of these uh, organic pollutants, of these pops, are contaminated foods, especially fish and seafood, also meat, and in lower concentrations, also milk and dairy products. So uh, our rationale was, well, in the vegetarian diet, when you exclude all these main sources of POPs, um, would, this in, would this decrease the exposition to POPs and uh, the plasma concentrations of them? Uh, POPs have been shown to be related to obesity, metabolic syndrome, and increase also the risk of diabetes. So the aim of our study was to compare the effect of a vegetarian diet compared to a conventional diabetic diet with the same uh, caloric restriction. Uh, the, the diet uh, went for three months on serum concentrations of POPs in patients with type 2 diabetes. And we wanted uh, to explore um, the relationship between uh, POPs and the parameter, parameters of diabetes. Uh, this was a secondary analysis from our previously published study, so only briefly. We used a design of an open parallel randomized study. We divided the patients into two groups to follow either the vegetarian diet, which was a, was a lacto of a vegetarian diet, with only limited uh, intake of dairy to uh, up to uh, one low-fat yogurt a day or the control group according to the official recommendations. The caloric restriction was the same, and we measured all the anthropometric and laboratory parameters. We also measured insulin sensitivity by hyperinsulinemic isoglycemic clamp. And uh, we assessed the beta cell function uh, by five-point um, meal test. And we measured uh, visceral and subcutaneous fat by magnetic resonance imaging. We measured uh, serum concentrations of 44 POPs uh, by high resolution gas chromatography and mass spectrometry. For statistical analysis, we used um, repeated measures ANOVA and um, multivariate regression model for assessing the relationships uh, between uh, the changes of serum POPs and uh, the metabolic parameters. 
Our study group consisted of 74 patients with uh, type 2 diabetes treated by oral hypoglycemic agents uh, who were matched in um, age body mass index and HbA1c. Um, the vegetarian diet contained uh, less, much less cholesterol. Uh, however, the caloric content was about the same uh, in both diets. Also, the analysis of the food records from the patients revealed that the energy in intake was comparable in both diets, and they really differed in cholesterol intake. Uh, to our disappointment, we didn't detect any differences uh, in serum concentrations of measured POPs uh, between both diets, except for PCB-169. Uh, uh, however, uh, we tried uh, to find the association between the changes uh, in serum POPs in the predictors uh, with explained variables, uh, the metabolic variables, and you can see that we detected a significant relationship b between 15 POPs and HbA1c, insulin secretion as one of the parameters of beta cell function, and fasting plasma glucose. After adjustment for changes uh, in BMI and visceral fat, you can see that uh, BMI didn't play any significant role, uh, and there was a trend uh, toward uh, a role of visceral fat. However, the trend was not statistically sig significant. Another question we asked uh, was then, uh, which of the POPs are the most important that play a role uh, in these uh, parameters of diabetes? Uh, so uh, we took each of the parameters separately, and uh, the circled ones are the eight most important ones related both to HbA1c, to fasting plasma glucose, and also to insulin secretion as one of the parameters of beta cell function. So in summary, uh, we didn't detect any difference between both diets in regards to serum concentrations of uh, POPs. However, we found a significant association between changes of serum concentrations of POPs and changes in HbA1c, fasting plasma glucose, and insulin secretion, independent on changes in BMI. And also, uh, we were able to identify eight most important POPs associated with diabetes. Uh, seven of them are uh, from the group of PCBs, and one of them is from OCPs. In conclusion, uh, the long-term exposition to POPs may exert diabetogenic influence due to their toxic effect on beta cells. And finally, I would like to thank my colleagues. I would like, like to uh, thank for, your, for their support. And uh, I hope that we will prove to be smarter uh, than how the Native American ca can see us. And I hope that we will not have to look for other planets uh, to, to have a place to live. Thank you for your attention. Angela Rivellese, uh, Naples, Italy. Uh, thank you very much for uh, all the present, uh, presenters. I have uh, two questions, one uh, related to the PREDIMED study and uh, the other one uh, to Ulf. For what concerns PREDIMED study, if I remember well, the Mediterranean diet with nuts <coughs> reduced uh, diabetes incidence by 18%, but this is not significant. Uh, instead, so is, uh, it appears to be less effective than the other kind of uh, diets for what concerns diabetes incidence. 
while it's effective for what concern cardiovascular events. Have you any uh, possible explanation of these differences? In case of the, the diabetes incident, we have observed for 18% uh, reduction yeah. on the incidence of diabetes. That this was not significant. It's near to the significance, but it's not significant in the group that received NATS. Yeah. But we have demonstrated a 30% reduction in, in the incidences of it. Uh, we don't have uh, explanations of these uh, differences, but uh, all, all this reduction is in the same direction, and probably we need uh, we don't have uh, not uh, a power in order to demonstrate these beneficial effects on on nuts. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, we have observed the same the same direction because okay. uh, the the composition. The, 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 the polyphenol composition of uh, nuts and, and, and uh, olive oil are very similar. There, there are differences, but uh, uh, both the groups are very rich in polyphenols and are uh, uh, food that are rich in monounsaturated fatty acids, polyunsaturated fatty acids in case of walnuts. So it's, uh, I suppose, is a change, change. It's only change. And one for both. Uh, uh, looking at the composition of your healthy Nordic diet, I was really impressed. The composition in terms of nutrients uh, by the fact that this composition was exactly the same of the composition of the diet rich in fiber that we have used for many years in our intervention study. So with the different traditional foods, we can achieve the same but exactly the same composition of diets. And since this kind of diets in our hands are mainly effective in the postprandial period, <coughs> have you data, especially on glucose metabolism, on the postprandial data? Um, thank you for this comment. We don't have, the, we have not done much postprandial studies yet, only glucose tolerance tests, and where we did not see. Um, so much in, in one of these studies I showed, but that was um, was not uh, designed to study that. But um, so no, we have not done postprandial, for instance, meal uh, tests, standardized meal tests. That would be interesting. Uh, yeah, so that remains to be done. Yes, hello. It's uh, Dr. Bernard Venn from the University of Otago in New Zealand, and I have a question for Neil Bard, please. Um, firstly, thank you very much for your presentation. It was quite remarkable to see those changes with the vegan diet, although I'm not sure that in New Zealand, which is a country that relies on its meat and dairy for its, <laughs> its main economy, that it would be a welcome message if everyone went vegan. Uh, but the question I have for you is um, regarding vitamin B12. So if these people are truly vegan, then they've excluded vitamin B12 from their diets. So um, what are you advising the, these people over the long term? Uh, because it may take a number of years to see a vitamin B12 deficiency manifest itself. Great. Thank you for, for um, raising that question because it's something that I, I should have included in my presentation. Uh, vitamin B12 obviously is essential for healthy nerves and healthy blood, and, and you have to have it. But it's not an animal product, and nor is it a plant product. Uh, B12 is made by bacteria. and. Um, so we encourage people to, uh, uh, meat eaters will get some B12 because of the bacteria that live in a cow's gut. Um, however, it's tightly adhered to protein, and so even many meat eaters tend to run low in B12, particularly if they don't make good stomach acid. Uh, if they're not producing much stomach acid or if they're treated with metformin, many of them will, will be marginal and low, or, or even if they're up in years a little bit. So the U.S. government has actually recommended for a, some time that everyone over age 50 supplement with B12 and not rely on food sources alone. And so anyone following a vegan diet would want to, to, to do that as well. So in all of the intervention trials that, that we do, we recommend B12 uh, as a supplement. And it's, it's um, added to many foods as well. Um, it's, you'll, you'll see it added to soy milk and cereals and all kinds of things. But I encourage people not to rely on that source and just to take a supplement. And, and in fact, I encourage that for, for everybody regardless, regardless of diet. So thank, thank you for raising that. It's very important. 
Yeah. Hi, uh, Livio Luzzi, Milan, Italy. Uh, congratulations. I have a question for Dr. Barnard. Um, first simple question. Uh, one glass of wine to your vegan patient is allowed or not? Um, and then I <laughs> it, well, wine is in the fruit group, so of course it would be allowed. Um, okay. <laughs> in, our, in our research, in, let me think, in, in I think virtually all the intervention trials that we've done, we've allowed men to have up to two drinks a day and women one. Okay. Um, and that's really, that's not a health recommendation. That's simply a question of what uh, is going to affect our outcomes. Now, were I to make a health recommendation, it would be different from that. Because when we talk to our friends who are in oncology, they, they remind us that women who drink even red wine um, have a higher increase, uh, they, have, they have an increased risk of breast cancer. If it's even one glass, if it's on a daily basis. So were I to make a, a health recommendation, I would encourage people to think about the, the other health risks that accompany alcohol. But in our studies, we, allow, we, did, uh, we did allow it. And then I have a, another question on the mechanism that you proposed, the, che, the chewing gum me mechanism, uh, the, the FFA uh, mechanism. <coughs> Besides that, don't you think that uh, an additional positive mechanism could be the content of plants, which is different from meat? Many protein derived uh, derive from, from plants have been shown to have uh, insulin mimetic effects, for instance. Phaseolamine from beans, uh, uh, other, other uh, proteins from other legumes uh, mainly are, uh, have uh, uh, an anti-diabetic effect. Um, it, well, it's a terrific question. It's, um, I, I was struck by, by Hannah's presentation about the fact that it's, it's not necessarily just the, the, the fat and so forth, but it's also what tends to accumulate in it that, that may exert some effects. In her case, she was describing the effect on the beta cell. I think is, is terrifically important. But then also when we look at what, what happens with beans, and, uh, and uh, Dr. Jenkins has done some very interesting writing in, in describing the portfolio diet, that if you look at, at the effects of, uh, of a number of constituents of foods, they will have, for example, a lipid lowering effect that can be independent, de depending on the type of food group we, we are speaking of. Um, so, so yes, I think there is something to that. Having said that, um, the, the big effect of a plant-based diet, perhaps, could, is, is a very simple one, that plants have fiber, animals don't. Um, so every single mouthful of a vegetable or a fruit or a grain or a bean gives you some fiber that reduces the calories, that causes you to feel full with fewer, fewer calories. Every bite of Velveeta, I mean, you get, it, it, it's not from a plant, it doesn't have any fiber, so you get all the calories that are in it. And I got to tell you, I really think that's probably the, 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 the big thing. There are, there are many other um, uh, actors that may explain its effect as well. Uh, Osama Hamdi, uh, Harvard Medical School in uh, Boston. Uh, wonderful start. It looks like we will have a lot of intellectual uh, discussion. I just came from the ADA, and we have a lot of uh, data as well. I have a very quick question for Olf and Neil. The first one for Olf. Uh, your Nordic diet, which you showed after a baseline and after eight or six or ten weeks, uh, is lower in caloric intake by around 550 and lower in saturated fat from 15 percent down to 5 percent. In reality, if you apply any diet that will have lower caloric intake by 550 and lower saturated fat from 15 to 5, you will get the same results. So it is Nordic diet or it is a low calorie diet. I, I was assuming that when you design a study, you will fix the caloric intake between the two groups so you can see the effect of the Nordic diet. Yes, that, that's an important point. And, and um, in that study, there was an ad libitum study, so it was not a deliberate um, um, caloric uh, reduction. That was because they felt um, satiety in, uh, that's was the reason they, they lost weight. But another study I showed the long term, the six month study was um, isocaloric. So that was matched to, to, so that was another, they should not really be co difficult to compare the results because, and that there the results was, was not as pronounced, but we saw result, uh, effects on, on uh, infl inflammatory gene expression on, on the blood lipids and some on the inflammation markers also without this weight loss. So, so it supports that, I think, 
part, a great part of some of the effects is mediated through weight loss. As, as you say, any diet have that effect, but, but also some of these are not related to weight loss. We also statistically adjusted for that and seem to, the blood pressure, for instance, might be more driven through other components and salt reduction also, but um, and the blood lipids was, seem to be very independent of the weight loss. So, so I think it's, it's a good comment, but uh, we need to do more studies to, to control uh, different types of controls. The energy. Okay. Uh, thanks. Uh, my second question to Neil. Uh, I like your presentation very well. And uh, in our Lancet article last year was Frank, who we mentioned among the dietary patterns a vision diet. But I would like to ask you, and I would like to know your perspective, why the prevalence of diabetes is booming up in India and China, especially in India. And Mohan presented some data, which is very interesting. Those people are mostly strict vegetarian, uh, majority actually of them, and they still get diabetes, even in the rural areas. So the prevalence of diabetes in India now is going significantly up. Uh, is there a question mark about vegetarian diet in India or? Um, when you travel to India and you are, are looking to adhere to a, a low-fat vegan diet, you're frustrated in two ways. The first is, um, the, 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 the use of phenomenal amounts of dairy products in the diet. And the second is uh, heroic amounts of oil uh, consumed. And when I give talks to, at Indian medical centers, the number one question is not what I get in Fargo, which is about where do you get your protein, um, which is what everyone asks me in the US, but it's how can you live without milk? And we always have a reception in advance of the lecture in which we're served what is called tea, but is three quarters milk. It's a little bit like the ice cap that I was hearing about. I don't think that's coffee. I think that's milk with some coffee added in it. Um, I could be wrong, but, if it, but uh, you see a lot of these drinks. And there's huge amounts of, of dairy, typically full fat dairy. And if it's non-fat dairy, what's the main nutrient? It's sugar. Uh, it's lactose sugar instead of fructose uh, or sucrose or something like that, but it's still a sugary beverage. So the, I think the issue in, in India is a huge amount of dairy and oil in traditional, quote unquote, traditional diets. But of course, there's been massive um, westernization in India as elsewhere. And when you, when you look in any city in India now, you're, you're, you're quite impressed by Pizza Hut and other western chains now um, in the airports and on the street and, and uh, a vegetarian diet being respected as the quaint uh, practice of our forebears that we now conveniently ignore. Um, you're suggesting that dairy would be beneficial for, for individuals? Um, that I'm not prepared to, to defend. I'm going to suggest that dairy products are a very high source of fat, particularly saturated fat, and that it's going to add to the, the problems that we're seeing here. Jim Painter, uh, US. Uh, two questions for all. One question is, the Nordic diet, the healthy Nordic diet, which seemed like a Mediterranean diet, had all these fruits and vegetables, nuts, seeds, and legumes. How much of the Nordic people actually eat that way? And the second question is, you talk about rapeseed oil. Well, in Canada, we talk about canola oil specifically because they want to make sure they don't say rapeseed oil because of the uricic acid. Did you take it out of it, or is it still in there? Thanks. Uh, I'll start with the, the rapeseed oil. Yeah, it's, it's, it's not there. So it's basically the same as canola oil. It's very similar, so uh, it's not no uric acid. Uh, in the, the rapeseed oils. And um, then uh, about how many uh, Nordic people that adhere to this healthy Nordic diet. I think it's, it's, it's not so, it's a minority as in all, all populations. There are uh, um, too few that are adhering to the nutritional recommendation, the national nutri nutrition recommendations. And maybe Ursula have a good answer on that. How many, well, I think it's like less than 30%. Uh, like, would guess is 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 uh, adhering to this healthy Nordic diet in the Nordic countries, uh, and I agree it's, it's close to the similar to the local, to the Mediterranean diet, which just use it's a similar diet in, in many aspects, but they, they just use maybe olive oil instead of rapeseed oil and have some other types of legumes, but it's basically quite similar. David. 
Deputy Jenkins Toronto, I declare my conflict of interest with portfolio diets and, and glycemic index. But so I, I really enjoyed the presentations. Um, uh, one thing really for, for all I had, he showed very interestingly that without weight loss, you managed to get a reduction in abdominal fat and uh, inflammatory biomarkers. Do you, is that, that common across all the diets, especially when you've got weight loss, do you get even more um, abdominal fat uh, reduction and better CRP, or is it just something that's long term? That you see in the long term, do you, do you need a long term? Can your more acute studies where you've shown you actually get weight loss, do you actually repeat the same things as you get in the longer term without weight loss? Um, that was um, seen in, in uh, three months, and, and um, um, the, the abdominal fat was reduction was not seen in the, in the isocaloric, uh, strict isocaloric study, but we, we was measured with waist circumference and was not a significant reduction, but that was, um, as I said, no rate loss. So, so um, um, I think we need to do more studies and show it in, in looking at long-term versus regarding abdominal fat and the inflammation, but, but it, I think that's a very interesting finding that we see this reduction uh, without weight loss, which is uh, at least in two studies. So, so, yeah. Final question. Yeah, I'm Fred Browns, Maastricht University, Netherlands. I have a question to Jordi and a link to Neil also. So two, two points. Uh, Jordi, the, uh, the choice of the control is always essential to show uh, effects of the experimental uh, lag. And in, in your studies, you have the Mediterranean diet, but the control is a diet in which you cut out the, the, the lipids as much as possible. And I would say that is a control diet which is on the unhealthy side. Now, you see benefits of the uh, Mediterranean diet versus control. And what I would like to know is how much of this benefit is explained by the unhealthy effects of the control. So what are changes versus baseline? That there may be a difference. So I would like to, to hear your comment on that. Yes, uh, this is impossible to, to answer. It's very difficult to answer what, because uh, we, we, have, we, we compare two, two different uh, interventions. No? Uh, what we have uh, changed in the preliminary study is the overall food pattern. And I think this is one of the important things in order to explain the results. Because, for example, we have used uh, the 40-point score uh, in order to measure this adherence to the Mediterranean diet. At the end of the follow-up, during the follow-up and at the end of the follow-up, we have observed little changes in the uh, total food pattern. But we have observed uh, significant differences in 11 of these 40 points. So I think that at the end, that we have observed is the result of changing the overall food pattern. Slow, uh, small changes, but a small ch changes that, uh, uh, that at the end we, uh, are changes, important changes in order to explain this reduction in, on, on uh, incidence of uh, cardiovascular disease or um, incidence of diabetes. I, and I, it is impossible to, to say w w what is the part of the healthy diet that we promote, the changes that we have promoted in the, in the, in the, in the both uh, Mediterranean diet groups in comparison to the control group, because in the control group we have also observed so beneficial changes in diet. Yeah, yeah, but you, you, you have a baseline where you start. So if you compare versus baseline, you will see the effects of both. And then it may be that it's not significant, whereas versus control, there is a significance. Now, there's one thing that triggers me. In, in the Mediterranean diet, you say, include fish, include oils, etc. cetera. Uh, Neil says, exclude the fish, exclude the oils, that's beneficial. If I would be a consumer, I would get lost here. Now, now what should we do? And, and I would like to hear your comment on that. Go ahead, if you start, please. Yes. Um, that, it depends. The la during the last years, uh, scientific, uh, uh, researchers have been focused on fat. Fat is bad. And I think that it depends on the type of, of fat. 
It's, it's the same that yesterday we were discussing about the amount of carbohydrate. I think is now we have proofs that the type of fat and the type of carbohydrates are more important than the amount at, that, uh, uh, at the end. So I think in case of uh, the Mediterranean diet, fat is a healthy fat. It's fat from vegetable origin that is completely different as saturated fatty acid. And in case of car carbohydrates, it's the same. The, the, the Mediterranean diet has a low glycemic index and low glycemic load. So uh, I, I think that fat is not bad. It depends on the type of fat. And in, in case of Mediterranean countries, we, we consume approximately 35% of the energy or more as fat, but it's vegetable fat in form especially of virgin olive oil that is very rich in polyphenols, in several bio, bio, uh, phytochemicals, and it's the, it's the same case of nuts. Nuts are very rich in monosaturated fatty acids, in polysaturated fatty <coughs> acids, and in polyphenols and antioxidants. Uh, and it's for this that this type of fat probably is better, better, is better oxidized also, uh, has uh, several benefits that can explain that in the Mediterranean countries we can uh, uh, consume more amounts of fat. Need a very short comment. Um, very short answer. Yes, um, I, I certainly agree that different fats have different properties, um, and, and that's that's quite dramatically so. Um, what unites them all is that they all have nine calories per gram, uh, compared with carbohydrate, which has only four, and that's something that's often forgotten. And when you have a patient who's got diabetes and they're trying to lose weight, and you want to limit the most calorie dense foods, if you're starting with sugar, well, that may be number two. Um, number one is the lipid content of the diet, and where you really see this coming in is with a, a salmon and enthusiast who forgets that Chinook salmon is 50% fat and Atlantic salmon is 40% fat. It's, it's a sponge filled with grease, basically. And they're wondering, why am I having trouble losing fat? I'm only eating good fats. And it's true, their thighs are filled with good fat. And so, what we, and their, their cells maybe as well. So, um, what, <coughs> where we arrived at this is by following the epidemiology, finding that the fish eaters do do better than the beef eaters, but not nearly as well as the people following uh, a, a vegan diet. So that's, that's guided our, our work. Thank you. So I thank all the speakers, the discussants, and also on behalf of Ursula, I thank all of you for participating in this very intensive session. <laughs>